I have done graduation in pharmacy. I'm a pharmacist. What exactly did you do? How much programming exposure and knowledge is required to appear for the exam? How many of you have seen the pyramid? I couldn't get the pyramid slide, but you've seen the certification pyramid, the change course. You've got a bunch of certifications in the categories. They sit on top. And we have somebody who has scaled that peak. Okay. And uh, I can say very happy that we kind of started working together long back ago. Uh, this is not to demean my own achievements or efforts, but definitely somebody who's done. Uh, a uh, much bigger achievement than there. So, Bibu, I would like to call you up on stage. Please, a, go, a huge round of applause. Uh, Bibu, maybe we'll start with a brief intro. And so, in the next 20, 30 minutes, what we are trying to get to is, a lot of us probably have thought about, okay, I want to become an architect. How do I become an architect? Or what is the right path? There's so many assumptions, questions. And uh, you may read about it, you may not have read. There are a lot of people who have already spoken about it, but this is a direct chat, and uh, we are going to take some questions from you as well. Uh, so, if you have any questions on that path, on the uh, sorry, uh, architect path, please uh, be ready with your questions because it's it's an interactive session where it's not standing here showing you something and talking about and teaching you something about the architecture. It's about the journey and. Uh, uh, yeah, I hope uh, we look forward to get inspired and have more CTs. By the way, do you know how many CTs are there in the world? Uh, yeah. No. Close how to many? No. How many? <laughs> With, this is, they can't find on Google. So, how many? Uh, the closest answer will be in one. 400. 300. 300. 200. 350. The closest has to uh, the, the winner. The closest is the winner. Okay, one last answer. 350. 400. We will start with your introduction and then Hello everyone. Uh, I'm pretty sure you can see my name on the screen. Uh, but I've been in Australia for around six years and I currently work as a senior program architect uh, in Melbourne office with Salesforce. Uh, how many of you here do not write code? Okay, I see about 10 percent. Do you think you can become architects? Yes. You know you can become architects. Do you know how to become an architect? Okay, some knows here, so I have some people at least who are listening to me. Because when I got to know, I of course knew like you that uh, people can go the architect journey and uh, you know make their way up. I know of some few other names as well, but when Vivo became one, it definitely uh, you know makes a huge difference. In, okay, how do how do you actually become one? So. He's somebody who's come from uh, a non-coding background. I don't know if he still writes code or if he is not, but uh, he's somebody who was never writing code in the first three or four years, which is to tell you people that it doesn't matter how good you are with code or not. Uh, the architect journey is still for you. And uh, I think that's the biggest question I want to start with people, which is what exactly did you do? in those last six years because I think uh, you, you got this study uh, 2021 20, 20. 2020 so about uh, one and a half years 2014 is when we actually start working together 15 so next five years give us a summary of what was the journey like and what did you start with because I don't think you were even a developer certified at the moment uh, 2015 uh, no I was not you were not yeah. so in five years from zero certifications to a CTA is, is quite something and not like he's he was a young 21 year old he had a lot of other things to take care of like all of us have as you can see right now as on, on the stage uh, this here uh, so yeah please throw some light here. and then yeah if I have to say probably there is a wand that was waved at me Harry Potter did that and then I got the certification but that's just a joke part but to be very honest, um, I don't even have IT background um, as an I, maybe you guys will be surprised. I have done graduation in pharmacy. I'm a pharmacist by graduation and also I did my MBA. Then I was actually working for sales uh, in healthcare company before even going to IT. So when I joined IT, I joined as a consultant. As I said, like I, Infosys was my uh, stepping stone then. 
Uh, I had no idea that I'm going to join IT ever in my life because I always wanted to be a doctor in my life. Uh, so everything changed uh, and then I joined IT in Infosys and and then I think in 2011-12 when I started learning this, it was more of a consulting that I was doing um, and I was also doing a lot of pre-sales uh, which requires you to do, understand the product and do the solutioning, right? So. When you do a lot of pre-sales activity, you have to understand uh, what are the different products that are available in the ecosystem and how you can fit them into different requirements because you usually work under pressure. I'm not saying that developers as a developer you would, or as a, any other role, you would not work under pressure, but then when it comes to pre-sales of uh, your submitting proposals, you usually don't get a lot of time and they would have obviously two days to submit like thousands of requirements or maybe 500 requirements. You have to analyze them quickly and then create the decks and then present them uh, with the right solution. Otherwise, uh, you would obviously not win the bid, right? And that's the main thing I think which contributed to my progression because that required me to pay attention to every product that is available in the ecosystem, every, uh, you know, everything, there's new features or anything coming up, how can I solve this problem quickly? And that's probably one of the biggest thing. Uh, like there are a few managers back in um, Hyderabad, Ashok, Anjali, who actually believed in me and then gave me those scope. I think without that happening, probably I would not be here and sitting in front of you guys are talking about this whole journey. I'm really, really thankful uh, for, to them giving this opportunity and then you know believing in me that i could do it and then of course when you go into projects you all are doing fabulous job it's about architecting is not about uh, learning something and then doing it it's a mindset so and i'm pretty sure you being in this ecosystem you would have heard that architecting is a mindset that you have to develop and you have to make that as a conscious effort so as a developer or as a, a functional guy, let's say an admin as well, when you're doing any activity for that matter, you're just thinking at that point of time, how you're solving. And what an architect does is the architect thinks back and then thinks about, okay, what is the impact of what I'm doing right now? So if I'm doing right now something, I'll solve this problem. Is this, if this problem continues to be there for my client, Whatever I'm doing now, is that going to be solved in next two years or next five years? Whatever I'm writing now, can my code sustain that quality of, or let's say the transaction volumes in next five years or next three years? That's something we, as a, when I also started, I never used to think about that. And that's the thing that you have to, or anyone who is kind of wanting to get into architecting space, they have to think about that. It's not about only this thing, but that is the one of the, key important factor about scalability as in you guys all know Salesforce is on cloud platform and there are a lot of limitations right so API limitations there are so many other limit platform limitations are there which we need to consider to design a solution and that's exactly what you're doing as an architect that you're thinking about it and actually designing a solution which can scale I think uh, scalability is what you will take away from that uh, and uh... By the way, Ashok and Anjali, I think they should definitely be watching this. Uh, so something, some somebody who we both worked and uh, at, uh, attribute our successes to. Thanks for actually mentioning them. Uh, I have another question here, which is actually, how many of you are an aspiring architect already? Okay, so people who are not aspiring. Do you still know the pyramid? Because we want to, we actually want to talk about that. But I'm like, can we skip that pyramid part? Do you know what is the uh, path to CTA? How many of you know the path to CTA? I'll put it that way. Not a lot. So maybe I would want you to throw some light on that. Uh, I know there's pyramid, but looks like we have people who are not very aware of that. But uh, yeah. Yeah, so there, I think um, there is in the pyramid uh, before you can be, you can even appear for uh, the CTA exam, you have to clear, become an application architect and uh, system architect, which uh, is called as a domain architect together. In order to achieve those application architect or uh, system architect, you have to clear certain exams 
right? Your integration architect, domain architect, or your data architect. Uh, then you have to clear your development lifecycle. And in my days, I used to have this mobile uh, strategy, mobile designer, which is not anymore existing. Then you have to do your sharing and visibility. Uh, then I think uh, platform developer one is one of the key ones. And they also ask you to do an optional item, which is an, um, your experience cloud consultant. Definitely that is not an optional thing. I would highly recommend anybody who is wanting to pay, get into architecting space understanding that as well very well because the exam really requires you to understand uh, experience cloud and yes definitely your sales cloud service cloud all those add added benefits like you definitely need to have them before you even can consider yourself for appearing you for the board exam that's a, that's the period. so that's the brief and i saw about 20 hands being raised who are already on the path to become an architect i have a question for you guys how many certificates do you think, in terms of number, are required minimum to become a CPA? Nine, seven. Nine, seven? Eight. Eight. Ten. Ten. Eleven. Seven. seven. If you've got the answer, I'll stop us. I'm pretty sure, see, the things are constantly changing and the certificates, because in my time, I had to give more certificates, uh, because as I said, the mobile one was there, which has been retired at this point of time, uh, but now it is not required anymore. So it's around, I think that's nine or 10 is, is a, a good number, which is prerequisite. But that doesn't mean that you just do that because when you go to the exam, they pretty much expect you knowing many of the other features is definitely that is the basic, but then that should not stop you learning the other items because in the exam, you are expected to know some other items as well. Like in my, um, I, I, as in it's, it's a very, uh, it's, 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 it's a thing that I can't talk about, but then definitely uh, because it's, it's the scenario, the scenarios are not something that you publicly talk about. Uh, definitely there are some public scenarios that are available, uh, but like there are cases where I had to use some other um, aspects of like, like parable, like that's not a, a something that you need to know as an, as a certification requirement. But I knew about Heroku. I have done my Heroku certification as well, but I started Heroku. I implemented projects on Heroku as well. So that gave me an understanding. Okay, hey, I can use Heroku as a platform also in this ecosystem and in this solution mix to give my solution. So what that tells us back is, I think the exposure to more areas helps us prepare better. Exposure to more problem statements, thinking of scalability, uh, even if it's not required at that moment of time or a few takeaways I could take. At this moment, I think uh, we'll take one question from the audience before I proceed with my questions to keep the balance on that. Is there a question, anybody? Okay, I see one there. Today's application is really mandatory to become a marketer or work as a Sorry, yeah. I'll repeat the question and then you can, you can answer. Is certification really required to become an architect? Can I not become an architect without actually writing a certification is the question. In Salesforce, as a new, if you're talking about CTA, no, that definitely you definitely require those certifications. But becoming an architect, IT architect, do you require a certification? Probably not. Like you can, without certificates, also you can be an architect. You study, you understand the platform, you can. Certificates are the ways of showing that you understand that particular domain or the knowledge you have. You're showcasing it in the market that you have that knowledge or you're establishing your credibility like for that matter like police inspectors if a police inspector is walking and then without wearing his like you know dress or badge would you know that he's a police inspector would you care no right so similarly you're just establishing your credibility by a certificate or your credit ranger or any other programs that you're doing those are just credibility to give you an example there very bad example not setting an example but an example I would call myself a solution architect and I only have two certifications. So that's why a bad example, but still an example of, yes, you can be an architect, but yeah, if you're talking about specifically being recognized by Salesforce as a certified architect, I think the journey is there. Any other question? <coughs> okay, I see two more there. Sir, please. Okay, we go and ask Andrew for the question. Okay. The communication part, uh, how is it different? How is it specific uh, to an architect? I mean, we all do the communication, even with the techno business one. But when it comes to a CTA, uh, how should I tailor my communication to uh, basically, I would say, present and uh, get? 
So I think the other question here is communication is important, definitely. So people who don't know, first of all, uh, architect skills uh, is a lot about communication along with your technical skills. And the question here is how much of a change or a specific need is there when you are approaching a CTA than a generic communication skill? I hope I've summarized it uh, well enough. Yeah. Yeah, so communication, as you said, communication is very, very, very important for this particular exam. Uh, even if you are uh, in day to day life, we, whenever we as an architect, we go in and solve our customer's problem, uh, we would, we have a lot of time there, right? So we can think about the solution, we can communicate, we can challenge them, not challenge, we do get into an agreement kind of, you know, sometimes we discuss about the options and they, they, there are budget constraints and all there are so many variables that come in when you actually go in and have a discussion with your client this exam they are very time limited so you have to practice or you have to understand that you are doing a solution within a, a time pressure and within the time pressure when you are communicating your solution that has to be crisp enough and it has to touch all the points or the bullet points which is which is part of your solution. And that's why you really require to have a proper set of communication and you have to practice that. Like even, I'll give you an example, within 40 minutes, they will probably ask you as we might be discussing the format of the exam in a while. So there is a section where they would ask you a question and in that like you literally get 40 minutes and there will be three CTAs sitting opposite to you and asking you questions. So they usually ask 30 to 40 questions within 40 minutes. Imagine you are being asked 30 to 40 questions and you have to answer 30 to 40 questions within that 40 minutes. So literally like you get 30 to 40 seconds to answer your questions. So if you're going beyond, so if you're, if you're not very well versed with your communication, then it's definitely one of the key aspects and it's, it'll be very difficult to crack this exam for sure. Just to add on a second, how to prepare for that to be yeah, yeah, sure. So, so there are obviously there are programs that is at this point of time, like uh, Flow Republic is doing Salesforce. Obviously, internally has uh, its own um, uh, model. Like uh, we we do coach our candidates uh, and prepare them. There are a lot of contents on the YouTube nowadays. I think you can see uh, one of my buddy uh, Johan. I think he publishes uh, a lot of content how to prepare for city and how the communication part is important and how do you prepare the answers and Steve Ben, I think Steve Ben's, there are a lot of YouTube content you can find. Uh, I definitely can uh, talk to you offline on this, but then there are a lot of content on YouTube where you can see how you can look at a scenario and how you want to respond to that scenario in those 30, 40 seconds uh, just to help you prepare for your communication. Thanks, Bebo. Uh, so just to, uh, you know, add a couple of more things. So when we say communication, I think the way we are brought up, the moment we say communication, the, what comes to our mind is English. And we start learning English, the, 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 the accent, the, the vocab. But I think the key points here uh, are how effectively you can express or convey your message. Like you said, every 30, so you have, you have only 30 seconds to answer a question. So in 30 seconds, you have to think, phrase and then get the right words in place. So uh, I think communication definition is slightly different, uh, which I wanted to bring it right up on here. So thanks uh, for that question and thanks for actually ask, uh, answering that as well. We had another question there. Hi, my name is Harish. Hi, Harish. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, in terms of this solution act, so now that you have coincidentally brought up this solution act, right? I mean, it's a very loosely term. I mean, there's a very fine line between the technical architect and the solution architect. And also Salesforce is branching out to B2B, so I mean, two other certifications. So, I mean, I would like to understand, I mean, does it add up to what do we, I mean, as an aspiring architect, do we also need to do that? Or, I mean, how does it play? I mean, I just want to understand. An architect does and again, there are Salesforce definitions, uh, like what is a solution architect, what is a technical architect, or what is, so there is again differentiation between a certified technical architect and normally who would work as a technical architect, right? So there are a lot of differentiation in there. But when it comes to solution architect, um, they expect you to understand certain product components, right? So it's like you understand the core CRM uh, and you understand the marketing cloud, you understand, let's say, commerce cloud, 
And when you're going to a client and then talking about designing a solution, so you understand the entire how there are different components of Salesforce are interacting with each other and having enough understanding to establish a solution. So your role is very important and it is a higher, uh, I think it's, it's the, you need to have a business analyst kind of a role where you're understanding the requirement, you're designing the solution and you're also supporting your development team to give the solution and you're continuously de dealing with that. CTA exam, from exam point of view, becoming a solution architect is not a requirement at this stage. So you don't need to understand e-commerce or commerce cloud. It's not a requirement. If you understand, it adds value. Yes, absolutely. You never know what kind of scenario is going to come. Scenarios may not require you to design the solution on commerce cloud at this point of time, as we are speaking, because every day things change in Salesforce. So as we're speaking now, it definitely is not a requirement. Uh, even for B2B solution architecting, uh, like having understanding of the B2B solution, uh, e-commerce, the commerce platform, you don't need to know that. Uh, but as I said, if you know it, like I know it now, like I did my B2C solution architect exam a few days back, my CTA journey helped me a lot. Like I didn't have to study for marketing cloud. I didn't have to study for core. I already knew about them enough. I had to study for B2C commerce because I never worked or I think never studied about them. So I studied about it and then I could clear that exam. But then yes, definitely it is not a requirement. Harish, does it answer your question? Okay, good. There's a lot more to add to that, but we'll take that offline. Any other question before we just, okay, I see one from uh, Shitij. Go ahead, Shitij, shout out your number. If I'm a consultant, um, how much programming exposure and knowledge is required to appear for the exam? Or clear? Projects. So how much of a project exposure do you need to have towards the programming uh, for the CTA? <laughs> okay, so there is there is obviously no straight answer to it, uh, but I'll try to address it. Uh, again, I'm a non-coder. Like to be now I can code, but then I cannot code probably, I'm pretty sure like 80% of the people or maybe 90% of the people over here can code better than me. So I can absolutely say that, but I can review your code. I can tell you what you have written wrong in code, that code. And because I can't write the code fast because I do, I'm not writing it for last so many years. I learned it. It is definitely in the exam. There is nowhere they will ask you to write a code piece of code or write a piece of trigger or apex class or anything but you need to have an understanding that is when to use apex or when to use your lightning web component as opposed to when to use your flow or when to use your lightning app builder so you need to have that much of understanding for this particular exam at least so that you can differentiate and say because when you're giving your solution that why do you want to use apex why can't you just use, let's say, flow for that? You, if you don't have enough knowledge to justify that, then you are out. Like, obviously, you will caught off guard, and then you will not be able to justify your solution. So you need to have enough understanding. But to be very honest, this is one of the exams which actually motivated me to learn more and more code, and actually I learned code more, and then did some practice um, in. I probably I don't know if there are any good code that I've written for any of the good projects, but then I've definitely written some bad code for some good projects, uh, which I probably, I wish I can go back and correct them. I'm pretty sure everybody has written bad codes in their life, uh, but I've improved myself over the years, but I don't write code nowadays to be very honest, like not too much. I do review codes. Uh, uh, I get into a lot of uh, advisory pieces and then I also do review codes so I can read code, I can tell you what wrong, what's wrong in the code and how to scale your code and everything else. Should they join Apex classes tomorrow? I think that's what it takes. You need to have the knowledge, Absolutely. if I can summarize. Yes. Uh, but how much are you going to really go put that in your projects uh, uh, is really yeah. a hard question to answer, I think. But you yes. definitely know, don't need to be a, uh, what do you say, it's a, um, you, yeah, design. it's like you don't need to be a really, really good coder to appear for this exam. So as I said, like I'm completely functional I all my life. I've done some coding, but I would consider that's probably 5% of my like, total last 10, 15 years or whatever it is. Like probably 5% of the time I would have done the coding, uh, but you have to learn it definitely. 
Thanks for that question. Thanks for asking that. And uh, maybe we'll come back to some of the questions which we definitely want to address. So I think some very good questions asked, which covered some aspects that we want to talk about, like communication, the solution architect versus technical architect question, how much code is needed. And there's more that you can definitely talk about. He is here until until we let him go, he'll not go. I think that's what he has signed up for. Uh, so, which means <laughs> all yours, but a bit about the structure because I think I've met people where they don't really know because when we th think certifications, a lot of certifications in Salesforce are, you prepare, you have got 60 questions, 80 questions, depending on whatever the exam is. You have a specific set of time, you go clear it and it's done. $200, $400. But CTA is different and maybe I would want you to throw some light on the structure, uh, the sequence. And I also, he mentioned, Johan, uh, it, it's, it's it's spelled as J-O-H-A-N. Uh, there's a lot of content from him on LinkedIn and YouTube. People who are actively preparing for uh, CTA, which he referred to. But here in this room, if you have to structure it out and uh, give us some tips, which can go on record. Maybe yeah, sure. So uh, once you clear your system architect and application architect, only after that you are eligible even for the board. So when we're talking about this exam, this exam is not a multiple choice exam, right? It's a review board. So when I'm saying review board, there will be a scenario given to you in the exam and it, you'll get now, it used to be two hours, but then now they have increased it to three hours. So you get three hours to read almost, let's say eight, nine pages of a scenario. And that that scenario would involve everything in a landscape that is possible for a Salesforce solution, uh, including your security, including uh, identity, including your development lifecycle, then uh, sales cloud, service cloud, or all the platform components, uh, and also the project management piece as well. So there will be a big scenario, and you have three hours to prepare for that scenario. And when I'm saying prepare for, you read that scenario, you address each and every requirement of that scenario and prepare, let's say a PPT slide or maybe a paper form, cargo form, whatever ways you want, you can prepare that. And then within that three hours, you completely, completely prepare the solution along with your data model and all everything. And there is a format, there is a structure to it. So you, you follow that approach and then prepare the solution and submit it to there, as I said, three CTAs would be sitting in, in front of you. If it's a virtual one, obviously you may or may not see them, but there will be three CTAs who would actually take these contents. Then they will uh, give you 15 minutes uh, between that three hours. And then there's the next set, uh, which happened is you get 40 or 45 minutes, 40 minutes to present that because you have done your solution in isolation. You have access to nothing. You have access to no internet. You have access to as a, you have access to internet, but you don't have access to any content. You have to do it on your own. Everything from your mind, you have to do it. And then uh, the next forty minutes is when you are presenting your solution. You are giving your justification, your recommendation. Like any client, you would go in and then go in and present your solution. Uh, so that forty minute goes to like like this. Three hours even go like goes like this. Like you don't even realize how those three hours fly by. Uh, then when you're presenting, uh, there will not be any um, communication from the other side. So it's just one way flow. So you are just presenting all your slides. You will, there'll be just like a you know, absolute wall there and you're talking to a wall like that. Like you don't see them because you're presenting your solution um, and it's virtual as well nowadays. So what happens after that, once you present your solution for 40 minutes, there's another 15 minutes gap, then they ask you a question for 45 minutes. And that is where whatever you have said, whatever you have submitted, they would have gone through that. They would have heard you. They would know that, okay, what solution you have chosen over what solution. And then they would ask you questions, which I spoke about that, that 45 minutes or uh, 40 minutes, they will ask questions constantly and understand what's your rationale behind giving a solution, giving an option. So yes, it's pretty, I think pretty uh, daunting exam, but I don't want to scare you guys. If I can do it, I'm pretty sure a lot of you can do it as well. So that's the format of the exam. Uh, it reminds me of a lot of things actually. If you notice three hours, what does it remind you of? If somebody says three hours for an exam, it takes me back to school time. Three hours. The other thing which it reminds me of is talking to a wall. So 
during this pandemic period, you know, we join a, uh, uh, my team members would know what I'm talking about, right? We join the meeting, absolutely everybody's on mute, everybody's videos are turned off, and they speak, you know, and say interactive. It's like, <laughs> it's, it's supposed to be interactive that way, but I think that has prepared people for this step of the CTA, where you're actually talking to somebody who's not responding, you can't see them. If it's virtual, you, maybe you can't see them because they would have turned off their videos and you still have to go about it in your own way. And uh, so I think some all of us are prepared for that part and for, for sure, which is that everybody's video is turned off and you're talking to a wall. But I hope that gives a structure of how 45, 45, 45 and uh, how much of it takes to actually communicate. So the communication part is actually mentioned, the preparation of 45. Uh, going through eight or nine pages of requirement, if any pre-sales guys or anybody who's architecting, how much time do we typically take for eight or nine pages of requirement? And I'm sure those eight or nine pages do not contain all those four words and branding. It's just like pure eight or nine pages of requirement. So uh, try doing that and you will know what it takes. But I'm sure it's doable, but I hope all the aspiring ones get a good idea of that. And on that note, I would actually say, okay, this, the people is here, open to a lot of questions, but I think this was a good, uh, opportunity and a good uh, uh, insight into what is what it to become a CTA something how does it make sense here okay I want you to realize the uh, with due respect to all of your time but we have somebody in the room who uh, was not supposed to be in Hyderabad today okay he's come here he was in India of course he's not traveled all over Melbourne uh, that will be unfair uh, or too big a lie to uh, speak on in front of camera but I want you to understand, what is the population of the world? Seven Google Karlo, yeah. Seven. Sorry, seven? Seven billion. And we're talking about how many architects? Yes. What is the percentage of four, what, is, what percentage is 400 of seven billion? It's a very smart answer, right? So it's point zero 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 one of somebody who is in the room and who is answering directly our questions uh, which is which is a big thing and I want to be thankful, I feel thankful, I want all of us to be thankful and also thank him. Thank you. I appreciate that moment that we have here. There will be things which are not going good, maybe we are off time, we are running late. Yes, we are not perfect but let's also look at some good things which are happening. That was a great session by Satya, this is a great talk, I definitely enjoyed it. By the way, I've never done a panel talk like this, so thanks, Pibu. <laughs> and this was not prepared, so it, it was all on the go, and I want to take some questions. So great audience, great questions. I'll let you go, Pibu. Any, any closing thoughts? So yes, be thankful, be happy, and uh, let's complain after an hour about things which you don't like. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. And it's my pleasure, actually, and then meeting you, meeting my friend, and obviously all of you together. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely not. So yeah, it's it's my pleasure to guys like and become see going from the same place. I as I said, I love Hyderabad for a reason uh, because this has given me everything. Like you know what I am today, it's because of this place. Like because otherwise I would not have come in here. I never would have been in IT or anything. So that's why I love Hyderabad and. That's why I always wanted to come back and then give back in a way that I can, whatever way I can. So feel free to reach out to me and and I promise that I'll try to be responsive. I get a lot of messages, uh, but I don't respond to everyone. Uh, but over the period of time, I definitely try to respond. It may be a kind of big delay, but definitely I'll respond. I wish you all the best, whoever is trying to get into an architect space or whatever you are doing in Salesforce, there is not that everybody has to go in and then be a CTA. Not every CTA is a good architect or not every good architect is a CTA. So don't uh, kind of think that way. So it's absolutely okay. Whatever you're doing, just keep on doing. Just be kind of, you know, ha be happy. And as Roshan said, uh, my journey started actually, not the CTA journey, but then journey with Salesforce or IT for that sake. It started back in 2011 when I actually joined Infosys in Hyderabad and I think around 2012, meet 12 or something, we I think we met. Uh, it was just by chance. I, I, I was actually trained in civil CRM, but it just happened by luck or by chance. I moved into Salesforce and Roshan was there 
Uh, we were like in the same office, um, sitting together, very close to each other. Uh, go for coffee, go for uh, you know, tea or anything like that, and discuss about projects. I had no idea what Salesforce was then, but he was a kind of a, obviously everybody knew who Roshan is, and like everybody looks for it. Okay, who Roshan is? He's a great developer. He was very very famous in that cubicle and like all the flow itself. And I was a new guy there and then okay, coming in there, I was working as a consultant and he was a developer and I would go into projects and I even had no idea what test classes were and all the stuff. So I have to go, I had developers who would actually do the development, but I, I was not knowledgeable enough then to actually review the code or actually understand the test classes even. So forget about test classes. Like I don't didn't even know that. Okay, you have to do like seventy five percent coverage and all this stuff. Everything was new with it back then for me. So I used to go to him, take help from him, and he actually immensely helped there. Like some of the projects, he actually helped us helped us in kind of delivering. And also after that, we worked in two projects together, uh, and we both were struggling then as well to go to on site. Both of us were having really bad luck. And every time our visa will come in and then there will be some problem or something will happen. Our visa application would not get approved. Both of us will talk to each other and then share our sad stories. But eventually that happened and then we moved on. Um, I uh, went to Germany and then a uh, whole lot of events happened. And now I'm here today. Um, I'm really, really glad that I've come back to Hyderabad. And to be very honest, apart from my hometown, I come from Bhuneshwar. Uh, but this is probably the city that I would love to live. If I have to ever live in India, this is probably the city. I love Hyderabad, to be very honest.